Hey guys, uh, welcome to another episode of IGCC Biology Revision. Today we're looking at uh, hormones and homeostasis, and this is a part of syllabus content 14. So before we start, uh, I want you to take a look at the topics we're covering today, have a brief read, and uh, we'll start the video. Uh, so the, the quote uh, given by the syllabus in terms of the definition of hormones is a chemical substance produced by an endocrine gland carried by blood and then altering the activity of one or more target hormone, uh, sorry, organs. And so there's a couple of uh, examples that you guys need to be aware of. Uh, the main one probably being the adrenal gland, which produces the, um, or secretes the hormone called adrenaline. And we've got the pancreas, which secretes insulin. We've got the testes, uh, which produce uh, or secrete testosterone. And we've got the ovaries, which uh, secrete estrogen. Now, as you already know, testosterone and estrogen are important in uh, developing uh, the sort of um, male and female characteristics, along with other specific functions. For example, estrogen also has a role in the menstrual cycle, but we'll also talk about that later when we um, go through the topic of reproduction. And uh, the pancreas uh, secreting insulin that uh, we will look at in this video, and it has a role in terms of regulating the blood glucose in our bodies. Um, now, you know, before we talked about, uh, in, in, in previous couple of videos, we talked about the nervous system and the nervous control, and it seems like the syllabus wants you to kind of understand the main differences between the nervous control and hormonal control. Uh, so I've built up a quick sort of table here to distinguish between the two, and the main uh, comparisons that you can make is one, the form of transmission, two, the pathway, and three, the speed, and four, the duration of effect. In terms of the transmission, of course, in the nervous system, we've got electrical impulses that carry the information, whereas in uh, in the hormonal system, it's, it's all to do with chemicals. And in terms of the pathway, of course, in the nervous system, we've got the nerves that carry the information, whereas in the hormonal system, it's all carried by blood. In terms of the speed of transmission, it would be that the nervous system has a lot uh, faster transmission compared to the hormonal system. But uh, once the information does get there, in terms of the activity and how long the effects actually last, uh, the nervous system only has a short-term run, whereas the hormonal system uh, has a fairly long duration of effect. So these four main things are things that you can compare uh, one system to the other. So we're going to go through um, the hormone adrenaline in a bit more detail. So as you may already know, adrenaline is a, a hormone secreted in you know, stressful fight or flight situations. The adrenaline has the effects of increasing breathing rate, increasing pulse rate, secretion, increased uh, secretion of glucose from the liver, and uh, pupil dilation. The main things being points one to three, because essentially, with increased breathing, uh, it allows more oxygen to be uh, transported around the body, and increased pulse rate means that you know the muscles in the brain can get more nutrients like glucose um, and metabolize um, and increase the rate of respiration. And that's important because essentially, again, adrenaline uh, increases the supply of oxygen and glucose to the body, and uh, this increases respiration in order to help us cope with you know, a dangerous or stressful situation. So if you're running away from a bear or something like that, then your muscles uh, need to work harder than ever before, and um, all these things above uh, will help uh, the, the muscles to gain more energy, more respiration, and uh, therefore allow us to either fight or run away from that bear. So in terms of homeostasis, um, you know, the definition is the maintenance of a constant, constant internal environment, and essentially it's the control of internal conditions within set limits. Uh, so, you know, basically the environment can change, the main one being, for example, the temperature. If it gets really cold outside, uh, we can't let our body turn as cold as what's outside, right? If, you, if you're going out in the snow, our body can't be at zero degrees because our enzymes and our bodily functions work better and, you know, it, it wouldn't work very well at that sort of temperature. So we need to keep it constant. And um, in terms of the human body, uh, we keep our temperature at 37 degrees and it's always maintained at that 
specific temperature. Um, and homeostasis is basically about keeping um, you know, all, all the entire environment inside our bodies constant and you know, the body temperature is just one example of that. Um, so for, for, your, for, your, for the sake of uh, Cambridge and IGCSC, the only two main examples that you need to know is body temperature and uh, blood glucose and how they're maintained. Um, so we'll go through the body temperature first. So you know we are warm-blooded, and that means constant body temperatures are uh, is maintained regardless of the external environment. And the human body temperature, again, as I said before, is maintained at thirty-seven degrees. Uh, when we we lose heat when it gets too hot, and we try and retain heat when it gets too cold, and so that is basically the the uh, mechanism of homeostasis. And so you know one of the main things are uh, when it comes to the body temperature is our skin and so naturally the syllabus wants you to understand the structure of the skin and be able to label it if, if they were to ask you. Uh, so this uh, in this diagram the only I think the only main things you need to know are the ones that I've circled. So we've got the sweat glands which obviously produce sweat. We've got the nerves which um, basically sort of carry information from the skin to our brain. Um, and of course, there's going to be receptors uh, inside the skin that detect uh, detect touch, temperature, and all that sort of stuff. We've got the adipose tissue, which is the very bottom layer, uh, which is another fancy word of uh, for saying fat. Okay, so it's it's just a fat layer, and of course, being fat, um, it's uh, you can naturally tell that it's a good sort of insulating material, uh, retaining heat in our body. We've got the erector muscle here, which uh, basically erect our uh, hair follicles when it gets too cold and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later and we've got the oil glands uh, which uh, is also within the, the dermis layer in the middle uh, which secrete oil and uh, we've got the veins and arteries falling down below here um, it's also important to know that uh, these little so the main branches are down below but they do sort of uh, branch out into more thinner you know uh, blood vessels so given that the red thick vessels down here are the arteries the little branches that you can see extending into the skin those are arterioles and you, they, you, there is a distinct uh, difference between the two essentially the arteries are a lot bigger and the smaller branches that lead out they're a lot thinner these are the arterioles and these arterioles are a lot closer to the surface of the skin and you'll know why that's important in a second so just make sure that you understand the uh, basic structure of the skin uh, take a look at the structures um, and make sure that you can actually label or draw out a the structure from scratch So in terms of temperature regulation, the main thing is, as we talked about before, down below here is the blood vessels, the, the arteries and the uh, veins, but uh, the, the arteries actually branch out into thinner, what we call arterioles, and they branch into the skin and they're a lot closer to the surface. So essentially what happens is when uh, blood gets carried through these um, arteries or specifically the arterioles, uh, heat gets radiated out and passed out through the skin. Okay, so um, that will become important in a second, but either way that's sort of what the diagram is suggesting. We've got the heat rays um, out at the top of the skin here and that's because all the blood that's uh, going through all these arterioles, um, the heat is being passed out through the, through the top of the skin. So, uh, in terms of temperature regulation, one, we've got the brain. Our brain actually has blood temperature receptors, so when our blood essentially uh, gets too cold, then the brain will coordinate some sort of response for us to um, you know, increase the blood temperature if, if it's getting too cold, or if it's too hot, uh, it will coordinate uh, some sort of response to make it uh, get lower. Okay. And so we'll take a look at some of these uh, responses, basically. So in terms of, you know, one main way that the skin incorporates uh, itself into temperature regulation is vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Um, so as we discussed before, heat is transported in the blood and it gets passed out through the, uh, through the top of the skin. 
uh, through the arterioles that uh, travel close by. So basically arterioles have these muscular walls which can either contract or dilate. So you can imagine when it gets too hot then we need to get more heat out of the body. Uh, so what will happen in the arterioles would that it would actually dilate, right? As you can see in this diagram here, the the muscles will dilate, meaning more blood will actually go will be going through these arterioles, and more heat will be radiating out uh, through the skin, which means that we will be losing heat, which is what we want if we're getting too hot. Now, if it's too cold, the opposite will happen, and because when it's hot, when it's cold, and we want to retain heat we want to make the blood flowing in the arterioles as minimal as possible so therefore the muscles around the arterioles will constrict uh, making the lumen or the, the, the hole in the middle smaller so less blood will be going through and therefore less heat will be radiated out from the blood because again blood, uh, blood carries heat and heat is retained in the blood and there's a couple of other ways in which uh, the skin can offer uh, basic uh, temperature regulation. In terms of, we talked about the fat layer. The fat layer is an insulator, and uh, that you know naturally helps to retain heat when it's cold. And we've got the hair follicles. So when it gets too cold, the hair follicles will actually stand up via the erector muscles. Okay, and when the hair follicles stand up like that, it traps air between the follicles and air itself is an insulator as well and that helps to retain heat in the skin and in the body. Um, along with the fact that when it gets too cold, we also tend to shiver and that's a mechanism that's initiated from the brain, uh, allowing increased metabolism in the muscles and as the muscles respire, as we sort of shiver, the, the heat circulation will increase throughout the body, allowing us to warm up. And a third one being sweating. Now this is the opposite. When we get, uh, when we get too hot uh, and the body temperature starts to rise, we sweat more because essentially when water from the sweat evaporates um, from the skin, it removes heat. From the skin and allows it to cool down. So naturally when we get too hot we secrete more sweat and when it's too cold we will secrete less. Now so temperature regulation is one example but glucose concentration is another example and um, homeostasis also works in order to keep our glucose levels in the blood uh, stable. And too high or too low glucose levels can actually be quite fatal. Uh, you can lose consciousness and all these other things um, that we don't you know, want. And so we want our glucose levels to be uh, quite leveled. So the important thing is that uh, the, the organ called pancreas secretes two really important hormones for this function. Basically we've got the glucagon and we've got the insulin and they have two sort of opposite functions. So Regardless of what they are, glucagon and insulin will both act on the liver, which in turn alters the glucose levels in the blood. So one thing about the liver is that um, this is where excessive glucose is stored. So when we have too much glucose in the body, that extra glucose will be stored in the liver and we call that glycogen. Um, so when sugar levels get really, really high, uh, we want to obviously lower the sugar levels in the blood. So what the body does is it makes glycogen out of that excess of glucose to reduce the glucose in the blood and store it in the liver. Um, and so when, oppositely, when sugar levels get too low, the body needs to do the opposite. So all that stored glycogen which is a storage of glucose in the liver, we, it breaks it down and it adds glucose back into the blood to raise the sugar levels. Okay, And so the insulin and the glucagon, which is secreted from the pancreas, has a direct role in this. So when sugar levels get too high, which is this first example here, the insulin will be secreted from the pancreas and um, it directly goes to the liver and acts on the liver and what happens then is it promotes glucose uh, to be converted into glycogen meaning more glucose from the blood will be converted into glycogen and then stored um, in the liver and that in turn reduces blood sugar levels in the blood because you know a, a lot of it has been converted back into glycogen um, when oppositely we've got really low sugar levels and we've got something called glucagon uh, that uh, gets uh, released from the 
pancreas and uh, acts on the liver again to promote oppositely glycogen forming glucose. So all that stored glycogen in the liver will be broken down into glucose and then uh, secreted back into the blood. And uh, that essentially will uh, increase blood sugar levels. Uh, so when we take a look at this example of you know maintaining blood glucose concentration, we also need to think about something called negative feedback, which is basically a mechanism by which homeostasis is achieved. So looking at this example, we've got you know first of all abnormally high blood glucose levels. So you know what happens then? Of course, as we talked about before, uh, the body will actually detect that, and insulin will be increased uh, or secreted from the pancreas. Okay, so once insulin is increased, uh, then what that will do is it will reduce blood glucose levels um, and it will continue to reduce it until the blood glucose actually gets lower than what we want. So when it gets lower than what we want, then that will also be detected by a sensor and then what it will tell the pancreas to do is for it to stop secreting that insulin. So essentially negative feedback basically means that um, if you know some sort of hormone is you know being released to do a specific function, in, in this case insulin is being released because the you know sugar levels in the blood is too high, then there needs to be some sort of mechanism by which the body actually stops the uh, secretion of insulin at some point. And um, so in this case, when the when the sugar levels get lower than what we want, then the body actually senses that and um, loops it back to the pancreas saying look we have you know you don't need to produce any insulin anymore we we have lower you know um lower sugar than we want and in which case then the glucagon may be um initiated to raise our sugar levels and so forth so it's like a, basically a cycle so um the topic itself isn't um, actually that hard but i suppose there is quite a lot of information to take um, take in. So just um, continue to revise, uh, but that is basically the end of this topic. So thank you for watching.